Welcome to Half History Will Travel. I am your host, the Wilder Historian, and I would like to thank Thumbscrew for suggesting this battle deep dive. He asked me to do a video on Antietam with no specifications, so I decided to look at the famed Stonewall Brigade at the Battle of Antietam. From the Brigade's first reputation achieving event at the Battle of First Manassas, its famed commander Stonewall Jackson held them in high regard. They stayed with the Army of Northern Virginia through many of the bloodiest battles of the American Civil War, and I think they deserve to have an entire video dedicated to their battle efforts. The fight along Antietam Creek was not their greatest outing, but much of their problems they had on the battlefield came from their haphazard way they and other units were positioned in order to attack, along with some command structure problems. At dawn on the morning of September 17, 1862, the divisions of Lawton, Hood, and Stonewall's division under John R. Jones occupied the vicinity of Dunker Church. Across the cornfields and woods from the Confederate Army was fighting Joe Hooker's 1st Corps, who planned to drive in Lee's left flank and take possession of the high ground around the church in order to place artillery there. For much of the early morning hours, the battle raged between the divisions of General Lawton and Union General George Meade, taking place in the East Woods and the Miller Cornfield. On Hooker's right flank, the famed Iron Brigade under Brigadier General John Gibbon, who was a career military officer that served in the Mexican-American War and battles against the Seminoles, he also wrote an artillery manual for the Army. His brigade was made up of the 19th Indiana and the 2nd, 6th, and 7th Wisconsin. The brigade sat across the Hagerstown Pike, moving south toward the Stonewall Brigade under Colonel Andrew Grigsby. His brigade was made up of the 4th, 5th, 27th, and 33rd Virginia. They sat just to the west of the pike, with Captain William T. Pogue's Rock Bridge Artillery Battery sitting in front of them. Pogue stated, Shortly after daylight on the morning of the 17th, the enemy infantry commenced advancing. The 12-pounder under Lieutenant William M. Brown, in conjunction with Captain Raines's howitzers, opened up upon them, and after firing several rounds and finding themselves within range of the enemy skirmishers retired to a position in rear of our infantry, from which they fired until compelled by the musketry of the enemy again to fall back, and there being no other position from which the enemy could be reached, they joined their respective batteries. The Iron Brigade, which had been moving south, turned to attack Colonel Marcellus Douglas's Georgians, just south of the cornfield. Seeing that the 6th and 2nd Wisconsin were about to be flanked by the Stonewall Brigade, the 19th Indiana and 7th Wisconsin moved to the west of the Hagerstown Pike to engage the Confederates. Major Williams of the 5th Virginia said, About 6 a.m. the advance column of the enemy approached our front, and the front line, which had been ordered to lie down for concealment and protection, rose at the command of their intrepid leader and poured in a staggering volley, which stopped his advance. For three quarters of an hour, the front line, numbering less than 400 men, maintained the unequal contest, holding their ground and doing good work. Heavy reinforcements advanced into the enemy's support. The front line was ordered to retire to the edge of the wood, above indicated, where in conjunction with the reserve brigade of the divisions, it remained for half an hour exposed to a terrific storm of grape, canister, and shell. At the end of this time, our line advanced into the open field, and encountered the enemy upon the ground which we had previously held. The firing was fierce and incessant, the enemy standing firm for a time. Unable to withstand the resolute valor of our troops, he retired in considerable disorder. About the time Pogue's battery removed themselves behind the Stonewall Brigade, the brigade's division commander, John R. Jones, became disoriented by a federal shell that exploded just above his head. He was quickly replaced by Brigadier General William E. Stark. With the rapid succession of officers to the divisional command, the command structure began to break down and the Iron Brigade, backed up by the 4th United States Artillery Battery B, led by Lt. James Stewart, and the 21st and 35th New York Infantry Regiments forced the Stonewall Brigade to retreat toward the Dunker Church, where they became disorganized. Stark led the rest of his division toward the successful Badgers in a counterattack, but the division commander was pierced by three bullets and would be taken to the rear and die within the hour. Major Williams of the 5th Virginia reported, The command fell to no unworthy successor in the dauntless Grigsby, who took the reins with a fearless spirit and held them with a firm hand. 
the command of the brigade devolving upon Lieutenant Colonel Gardner of the 4th Virginia. The heavy losses sustained, the confusion unavoidably arising from the change of commanders, and the protracted nature of the contest rendered necessary the withdrawal of our weary troops to the wood from which they had advanced. Stark's death placed the Stonewall Brigade's very own commander as the head of the division. Grigsby, a native of Rockbridge County, Virginian, and Mexican War veteran enlisted in the 27th Virginia Infantry when the Civil War broke out, became its major, and worked his way up the ranks. Grigsby was finally able to get the division organized, though horribly bloodied by the earlier attacks, and as Hood's division got pushed out of the cornfield on the Stonewall Division's right, Grigsby was able to ease the retreat of the fellow comrades by deploying a devastating fire into the same men who had driven them away from their original position earlier that morning. The battle raged to Grigsby's right, but by 9 a.m., Edwin Sumner's 2nd Corps made their way to the field, and Willis Gorman's brigade of that corps attacked the small Stonewall division and pushed them again from the position. For the rest of the battle, the Stonewall brigade and division would act as support for the Confederate reinforcements. Although this battle does not show the Stonewall brigade in the best of light, it is an important event to illustrate how the deaths of officers can impact the division and brigade commands and render battle chaotic. The division, and especially the brigade, was incredibly under strength, and with many of their veteran officers being killed or wounded, the command structure broke down, and that resulted in them not being able to hold their position on the Confederate left. Stonewall Jackson replaced Grigsby with Brigadier General Elijah Paxton as commander of the brigade after the battle. Grigsby would resign a few months later, irate over being passed over for promotion. Thank you so much for watching. I have a Patreon page if you'd like to support the channel that way. Starting in October, I will be creating a newsletter slash magazine with one article and one book review written by me, and it will only be available to all Patreon members. I also have a Teespring store, Facebook page, and Twitter page for the channel, and you can find the links to those in the description below. Please share the video, and I'll see y'all next week.